Hello again. Uh, that was an amazing panel uh, and indeed an amazing workshop. Uh, we at MIT, RPI, and SUNY are tremendously, tremendously thankful for both your attendance and for all of the wisdom we have gained from the panelists and speakers. There is so much to take away from the conference. So uh, Nick, Bob, and myself decided to just put together last, just very few slides to put together what we have heard in maybe uh, the beginnings of a conversation that should extend beyond this workshop. So the workshop itself has shown us that there's a journey that, take up, that startups take to reach the mountain of deep tech. And we have mentioned values of death. We would suggest there are three values of death that come out of the discussions we have had. There is the value of death of the idea. And maybe about 10% of those that imagine the fantastic next technology will actually get funded to try it, to start it, to attempt reaching for the prototype. Once they do get started, they still need funding to get to the prototype so they can get to the advanced development for scale up. And that again, there is a number there that reduces their numbers. Lastly, there is the valley of uh, jumping over the scale up itself to the peak of profitability that one hopes to reach. The journey of actually delivering such an idea indeed might take 10 years for a typical hard tech startup and over $100 million. Statistically, if you look at any hard tech developed over the last century, those are the numbers that you will find as being absolutely typical. If you're reinventing technology from scratch without all the elements of the foundry already available for you, you will find both money and time are needed to build the tools, prove the processes, and convince the next set of makers to make your technology to reach millions. And there are a few other takeaways. So I think one of the challenges or some of the challenges for academia in taking a look at this is just really trying to recruit students that are interested in semiconductor technology. We need to really create a talent pool for startups. Uh, and we may need to find a way to push semiconductor technology down into the high school level. So students are actually ready for a supply chain. Uh, said another way, trying to find those little stick figures on, on Vladimir's mountains and barriers. And we need more people on those paths. Um, that goes into the second one. You know, we need fab tech earlier in the educational process that doesn't exist. One of the speakers today mentioned that they had done some of that for software development, a lot lower barrier for software, but we did the same kind of thing. We need to, for lack of a hackneyed phrase, maybe uh, make semiconductor tech sexy to younger kids as a means to really be able to make a contribution to society. Uh, and it's too late by the time they get to, uh, to the university level as a rule. Um, we need many more small student faculty accessible fabs uh, to drive that talent pool creation and much faster innovation at the university level. Um, I'm not sure how we get there to do that. All I can say is that I don't think that we have the proper models today and that incremental improvements in what we do have today will get us there. Um, we need to think IP strategies for protecting startups and facilitating that coopetition. Uh, that I think it was Bob Metcalf that mentioned at the beginning of the day. Um, if you've traveled extensively in Taiwan uh, and toward the semiconductor industries there, you know exactly what coopetition is. And you see how they actually groom it between companies in Taiwan. Um, of course, you can also say that in Taiwan, IP doesn't matter. That's not quite true. But that's the perception that Americans have with the huge focus on intellectual property and battles over uh, uh, its value. Um, and finally, really need better early stage funding models. Um, we need much bigger pools of reserve capital uh, to be able to encourage people to enter this field uh, and then innovate and drive technology in the space. We really need to rebuild the semiconductor industry in the United States. And it's gonna take some really new thinking. And with that, I'll pass it over to Nick. Thanks, Bob. Some additional themes from today and a couple different buckets. Talent, um, obviously Bob really covered this and it was this theme throughout. Um, really seeing universities more as talent generators um, and not just for training the next engineers, but the next batch of entrepreneurs. 
um, providing inclusive and targeted education, as Bob mentioned, at all levels, K through 12 to postdoc for semiconductor industry specific training opportunities. And a few speakers mentioned the opportunity for immigration reform to unlock some ideas and retain talent. On the facility side, we saw tons of, um, tons of uh, discussion around the need for shared facilities and access to bridge tools. Um, of all sizes from six inch all the way up through 12 inch, you know, 200 through 300 millimeter tool sets and equipment. Um, that's a topic of great debate among my colleagues here and something that we, we definitely see the need for across the board. Um, and academia can't do it alone. We need government and industry to step in, provide that certainty in the market and fill the knowledge gaps that um, higher ed can't do by itself. And then on the capital side, it's obvious that we need record levels of investment um, starting from the non-dilutive funding that goes to support really early stage technologies and centers that institutions like the ones here and that are participating in this workshop um, have and ending with, you know, private investments in companies and facilities that will support these startups and technologies and actually help them get to market. Um, and it's clear that these strategic investors, like the ones that we highlighted today, are really going to accelerate these startups and technologies time to market through the channels that they bring with customers and supply chains. Now we'll kick it back over to Vladimir. Thank you, Nick. There are many opportunities that we listed and there are many, many more. Uh, we can enhance the chances of a startup success by giving them few things. Three that are listed here on this final slide is access to existing shared facilities. It can dramatically reduce the cost of starting up, dramatically reduce the depth of that value of debt, at least the first two, giving you hence a chance to reach the stage of making that prototype and convincing consequently that VCs or others, established companies, to invest into the opportunity of growing your idea. Discounted use of tools, processes would be extremely valuable and access to entrepreneur training programs, uh, just like the ones we heard about today. All of those are keys to preparing your next startup. It's not just the idea, it's also the process of scaling that idea, process of training the talent and understanding of the stakeholders that you'll encounter along the way. We need a national program that can bring many more startups to the scale-up stage. In essence, with the money we spent, we should have more shots at the goal, and that will yield more successes and resurgence of national ability to remaster the dominance in microelectronics and many other high-tech industries. With that, we will close the workshop for today. Thank you so much for participating. And our huge thanks to the organizing committee that beyond the three of us also in involved Amanda Stoll, Dick Tristofaro, uh, Rick Gardner, Tom Gerdy, JJ Hu, Jessica uh, Stanley Updike, and all of the other of our colleagues at RPI, SUNY, at MIT who inspired us to put together this workshop. Thank you all. <laughs>